This is the last lecture. We're going to cover chapter 14 and 15, data preparation and analysis, and uh, the beginning or some of the uh, ideas behind statistics and why you need to, to learn them if you're going to be a research psychologist. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to do, I, I you know, I, di I didn't come up with th this idea that you needed to come up with a research proposal uh, just to be mean or or uh, trying to get you to do something. That's not that wasn't my purpose. I wanted you to learn how to how how these things go together. And if you do it yourself, I can tell you about it all day long, and and it's just not really gonna. It doesn't have to stick. But if you do it yourself, then there's a high probability that you will understand what you're getting yourself into when you start doing research. And uh, of course, you have to take Christine's class. Uh, potentially you'll you'll want to do your own research before you graduate or you'll want to go into research after you graduate uh, so now you know what it it feels like what it looks like uh, the questions you have to ask yourself in order to get uh, to, to uh, be, be able to uh, come up with a viable plan for uh, for research that was my idea I'm trying to teach you how to do these things um, and I hope some of it stuck. Uh, and, and like I said, uh, I, I wasn't really trying to, to uh, this wasn't busy work uh, as far as I was concerned. I was trying to teach you uh, what, uh, what you needed for, uh, for, for re research. Uh, it's easy to talk about it, but it's not that easy when you have to come up with it yourself. So let's go ahead and get started. It's kind of a fun chapter. I, I was looking at it before. Maybe. There we go. Um, data preparation and analysis, chapter 14. Coding schemes. Uh, the number assigned to any observation is called a code. This code should be consistent across cases or units of analysis when the same condition exists. Uh, information on what a code means should be listed in a code book that accompanies the data set. Now, of course, this, this is, uh, has more to do with qualitative research you're looking for specific uh, ideas, uh, or you know, it, it can also be quantitative, but uh, normally it's more it's more qualitative. If a code uh, of one means female, the variable associated with gender should be coded as one for each female. Researchers use codes to group various classifications of a concept. The following are examples of, of the occupations that can be coded. Lawyer, hairdresser, carpenter, broker, salesperson, veterinarian, ER nurse, migrant farm worker, uh, executive, engineer, electrician, advertising agent. Uh, now, if you put all these together, you go, oh, there's, uh, there should be uh, 12 different codes. But the reality is, uh, maybe that's not what you're looking for. Maybe you're looking for something else. Uh, the researcher needs to organize the occupations into categories. For example, professional and managerial uh, would be lawyer, veterinarian, executive, and engineer. Uh, technical and sales would be advertising agent, broker, and salesperson. Service and skilled labor, hairdresser, ER nurse, electrician, and carpenter. And unskilled labor, migrant, farm worker. Uh, systems of categories such as this are referred to as coding schemes. Uh, once upon a time, I was, uh, they were doing research in my hospital, and uh, <laughs> for professionals, uh, the only professionals we had in the hospital were doctors. Doctors and, uh, and nurses were, were professionals. Uh, well, some of us had uh, lots and lots of knowledge, uh, but it didn't have really have to do with knowledge. It had to do with the way they wanted to uh, code them. So what they called us, uh, laboratory technicians, um, uh, X-ray techs, uh, pharmacy techs, uh, what they called us were ancillary uh, services, people of ancillary services, which made people a little bit upset because uh, the lab officers got to be professionals and they, and they didn't do hardly any work, uh, but uh, they, made us, they made us ancillary services. Uh, and it didn't really make any difference. They were the one do, done, They were the ones doing the research. They were the ones that needed to code, uh, whatever. Uh, the initial rule of coding is that the numbers assigned must make intuitive sense. In order to maintain the reliability of your coding, 
you would probably want to confine coding numbers to those starting with 0 or 1 and increasing by 1 over each category. Sequentially, uh, numbering the uh, category starts starting at 0 or 1 helps to minimize the risk of miscoding. Deductive coding allows researchers to use theory to, to construct response uh, categories before they administer the instrument to respondents. Researchers using deductive coding often pretest the instrument on a small sample of the population of interest so they can modify the categories suggested by theory uh, to fit the specific population. A researcher's intuition is one of the several factors involved in coding decisions. Uh, theory, mutual exclusivity, uh, exhaustiveness, and detail must also be considered. The actual categories the researcher develops must be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. That is, each response should uh, clarify, clearly fall into only one category, and that would be mutually exclusive. Every response must fall into a category, and that's exhaustive. Researchers must also ensure that the categories they choose are not so broad that important differences are obscured, and this has to do with detail. Uh, consider the following categories designed to determine the living arrangements of students live in dormitory, live with parents, live off campus, live with spouse. These categories are not mutually exclusive because students who live with their parents most likely also live on ca off campus, and students who live with a spouse might live either in a dormitory or off campus. Respondents could not be sure which category they should mark, and people with the same living arrangement might choose different categories. So you need to make it exhaustive and uh, so that uh, only one category fits each individual. If we are interested in learning whether students in supervised, semi-supervised, and unsupervised living arrangements differ in academic performance, we might use these categories. Live with parents, supervised, live in dormitory, semi-supervised, live off campus, either alone with friends or with spouse, unsupervised. Exhaustive dictates that the enumeration of the categories is sufficient to exhaust all the relevant categories expected of respondents. Each and every response or behavior can be classified without a substantial number being classified as other. Uh, I was getting a drink. Thank you. Coding scheme guidelines uh, would in doubt add another category. Uh, the theory and your knowledge of the subject matter and sample should all guide the level of, of detail of the categories. Inductive coding, the researcher designs the coding scheme on the basis of a representative sample of responses uh, to questions, data for, uh, from documents, or data collected through participant observation. Once the researcher has identified a coding scheme, it is applied to the remainder of the data set. The responses mentioned uh, most frequently are in included in the coding scheme used to, to analyze the data. In general, if a man physically abuses his wife or live-in partner, what do you think the woman should do? Uh, number one, she should stay in and try to work out the problem. Number two, she should leave the house or apartment. Number three, she should call a social service agency for advice. Number four, she should call the police. Number five, she should obtain a temporary restraining order against the abuser. Number six, she should call a friend or relative for help. Number seven, others specify. And number eight, don't know, refuse to answer. And number nine, missing. Now, this should cover just about everything. In an inductive coding scheme, the risk responses mentioned most frequently are included in the coding scheme used to analyze the data. In the preceding example, val uh, values 1 through 6 were mentioned frequently enough to merit their own categories. Values 7 through 9 were added once the inductive uh, approach generated the first categories. In the final coding scheme, the researcher will use the other category or less uh, for less frequently mentioned responses. Categories are not always easily identified, and comprehensive coding schemes can take a long time to construct. The researcher's time is spent switching back and forth between the raw data and the evolving scheme until the categories are applicable 
to the to and tied in with general purpose of the study. Uh, I was thinking about this before uh, before I started this lecture, and I was thinking, you know, what if uh, what if one of my students wanted to categorize uh, the student groups in uh, in their high school uh, when they were going to high school? Um, so if we did it the way they did it uh, in Breakfast Club, which was made in the 1980s. Uh, there was, uh, let me see if I can remember this correctly, there was Sporto, there was the guy that was in sports, there was the popular girl, there was the thug, there was the uh, brainiac, and then there was the uh, weird girl. Okay, so what if those were our f five categories? And of course, we tried to put those five categories at your high school. Uh, would, that, would all those fit? Um, would somebody fall uh, outside of that? Would somebody, would there be, you know, uh, uh, pot smokers? Would there be uh, cigarette smokers? Uh, would they be a group? Would there be um, uh, bikers? No, not bikers. Uh, the guys, uh, who are those people? <laughs> uh, skateboarders. <laughs> Would there be a group of skateboarders? Would there be a chess club? You know, it, it really all depends. And of course, that's what inductive coding is all about. You need to hit, hit all the categories. So if we were doing this, you know, back in the 80s, you could probably categorize people using the five people from Breakfast Club. But um, I think I got them all. But if we were doing this today, of course, it would com be completely different. Um, Sure, you would you would still have your sportos and your popular people, and your thugs and your brainiacs and your weirdos, uh, but there may be other categories. There may be a category for traditionals, uh, for Christians, or for uh, for religious people that are of uh, uh, or Christians. Uh, you could have a Mormon group. Uh, you know, it it would really all depend, and your categories would have to do with your school. So if you think of it that way, you can understand that each situation, each school, each high school in, in the area uh, would probably have different categories. So what you used at one high school, you probably could use at another high school. Maybe there were rodeo guys. Uh, maybe there were, uh, <laughs> when I was teaching uh, high school in 1983, 1984, uh, we had a group of people that were were pig farmers, and they weren't the same as our uh, uh, beef farmers, uh, the people that raised beef, um, and they weren't uh, they weren't the same as our grain farmers. This was in Nebraska, of course. So uh, you know, all of that was a, a lot different. So if if I were going to categorize somebody uh, from uh, when I was uh, teaching high school, it would be completely different because you, you don't have pig farmers. Uh, you do have uh, people that raise cattle, but you don't have uh, pig farmers and you don't have really have that many grain farmers. I don't know that you would have enough for a whole category. But uh, at that point, and in Nebraska where, you know, the fields are 600 acres and, and they grow wheat and corn and, and soybeans, you know, that, that would be a category. And they all played football. <clears throat> Real popular. Advantages of inductive approach, uh, flexibility and richness. Uh, it, en it enables the researcher to generate explanations from the findings and apply a variety of coding schemes to the same observation and often suggests new categories as well. Shortcoming of inductive approach, researchers may be bogged down by the mass of details as they try to explain the data. Sometimes too little context is preserved for the coder to determine which details are trivial and can therefore be eliminated. Code numbers should uh, make intuitive sense for variables that can be uh, rank ordered. For example, higher scores should be assigned higher code numbers. And in, in deductive coding, categories should be linked to the theory from which the, re the research hypothesis was derived. Deductive coding is most common with quantitative research. Qualitative researchers usually design the coding scheme 
and inductively uh, from the scheme inductively from the data in their effort to develop grounded theory. The coding uh, categories must be mutually exclusive. Each unit of analysis should fit into one and only one category. Uh, the coding scheme must be exhaustive. Uh, every response must fit into the category with a few responses being classified as others. Categories must be specific enough to capture differences using the smallest possible number of categories, the criterion of detail. Codebooks contain information regarding each variable's name or number, uh, the coding scheme, and codes for missing data. The codebook uh, serves as a guide for the coders who will translate the raw data onto an input device for later use in computerized statistical analysis. It is also a reference for the principal researcher and other researchers who wish to use the data set. For research involving the use of surveys, the actual survey question is often included in the codebook. And there's an example of a codebook. Uh, okay. And they're talking about education. Once it or any reason. Okay, anyway. Uh, coder reliability, all things being equal, studies with a well constructed codebook, pre coded and clo closed ended questions, and proper coder training are typically more reliable than studies lacking in one of these criteria because coders do not have to exercise their own judgment uh, in deciding what code to give a response. Intercoder reliability, one of the biggest problems in studies is making sure that the coders place the code in the correct column. It is standard practice to recheck or verify a sample of each coder's work to ensure that he or she has not been lax. Coders are required to exercise more uh, judgment in classifying responses when they are coding open-ended questions or other non-structured material. When the rules for classifying responses do not clearly apply to, spe to a specific response, different coders may classify the same response differently. And to increase coding reliability, researchers need to keep the schemes as simple as possible and train coders thoroughly. Coders can use spreadsheets to organize cases in the rows and values of the variables across the columns, most statistical programs require that the data be arranged in this manner, and data entry personnel can quickly key in each line from the spreadsheet. However, the use of any kind of transfer sheet requires multiple handling of the data, which increases the possibility of miscodings and threatens reliability. Coders can use spreadsheet forms or organize cases in the rows and values of the variables across the columns. Now, what I want you to think about right now is uh, the, your own uh, research proposal and how you would how you would uh, put all this information uh, onto a spreadsheet. That's what you need to be thinking about. Most statistical uh, programs require that data be arranged in this manner, and data entry personnel can quickly key in or import each line from the spreadsheet. Edge coding is used to eliminate the need for transfer sheets. Coders transfer questionnaire information directly onto, a, onto spaces at the outside edge of the instrument. When the instrument has been edge coded, a data entry worker can key the information from the edge directly to the data storage device. Reliability is enhanced because the coder's eyes do not have to leave the instrument and do not have to keep close track of column positions. Two forms of direct uh, data coding, uh, coding from a questionnaire Material coded for, from uh, questionnaires must be edited to ensure that missing responses have a des designated code for the input. The coder then keys in the response. When a case is completed, the program adds the information directly into the raw data file. Again, this method reduces the number of data handlers, which enhances reliability. Coding by telephone interview, uh, computer-assisted telephone uh, interviewing, uh, and computer-assisted personal interviewing greatly reduce miscoding. Computer-assisted telephone interviewing and computer-assisted interviewing greatly re oh, we already said that. Uh, 
Computer-assisted telephone interviewing, interviewers read questionnaire items directly to the respondents and input responses as they are given. If the coder keys in an inappropriate code, a value that is not designated for the particular variable, the coder is prompted to give a real value. Automatically, uh, it automatically skips questions or jumps to others as a result of filter questions. Its efficiency has reduced mail surveys. Editing and cleaning the data are important steps in data pr processing that should always precede analysis of the collected information. Data editing uh, occurs both during and after the coding phase. Data cleaning is a proofreading of the data to catch and correct uh, errors and inconsistent codes. Software programs perform most of the data cleaning for larger scale efforts, uh, testing for logical uh, consistency in the coding specification. Uh, though many questions are answered and coded independently, others are interconnected and must be internally consistent. Data preparation and analysis is almost exclusively handled by computers using statistical software and other workflow programs. In addition to SPSS, there are a number of other statistical software programs that compete in the same market. Uh, SPSS has to do with uh, social sciences. Uh, I think this is the one that we use at Diné College. Uh, you'll have to ask... Uh, Dr. Russ about that. SAS and STATA. STATA. These programs are highly flexible so as to import data from and export data to other mediums, for example, Microsoft Excel, text, and ASCII files, and so on. Uh, store, uh, store the data in a comparable way while allowing researchers to label variables and define codes for each variable. Uh, they have the capacity to pull codes from other documents that are applied to the variables in the data file. Uh, each of these programs can generate reports that effectively produce a list of variable names and their associated codes. There have been a number of developments in the area of free statistical analysis software uh, our project for the for statistical consulting, our project is available for free download and use. It contains extensive documentation on getting started, user written modules, and programs for more targeted types of statistical analysis, and an extensive online wiki to discuss any problems. Uh, our project for statistical consulting also has a number of benefits that SPSS, SAS, and STATA uh, do not, most notably its graphics capabilities. And now we go to chapter 15. Since at least 19, the 1950s, all social science disciplines have experienced a rapid increase in the use of statistics, and they have become essential to the field. Without statistics, we could not see the patterns and regularities in the phenomena we study. We need statistical methods to organize data, to display information in a meaningful manner, and to describe and interpret the observations in terms that will help us evaluate our hypotheses. Two major methods, uh, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Uh, getting a drink. <clears throat> Descriptive statistics enable researchers to summarize and organize data in an effective and meaningful way. Descriptive statistics provide tools for describing collections of statistical observations and reducing information to an understandable form. Inferential statistics allow researchers to make decisions or inferences by interpreting data patterns. Inferential statistics are used to determine whether an expected pattern designated by the theory and hypothesis is actually found in the observations. Both descriptive and inferential statistics help uh, social scientists develop explanations for complex social phenomena that deal with relationships between variables. Statistics uh, provides the tools to analyze, represent, and interpret those relationships. And as you can see, if you look at uh, all of the uh, possible uh, 
uh, uses of, uh, of statistics, the mean is, is utilized more than anything else. Uh, correlations are, are next, then regression, uh, as in regression analysis. The median, the standard deviation is uh, at 61% cluster analysis, and you can, as you can see, all of these things are utilized, with the mean being used more than anything else. After data have been coded and prepared for processing, they are ready for analysis. A researcher's first task is to construct frequency distributions to examine the pattern of resp response to each of the independent and and dependent variables under investigation. A frequency distribution of a single variable, known as a univariate frequency distribution, is a table that shows the frequency of observations in each category of a variable. To construct, the researcher lists the categories of, of the variable and counts the number of observations in each. Nominal variables may list, any, uh, may list the categories in any order, uh, for the variable gender, either category male or female may be listed first. Uh, ordinal uh, variables represent different rankings. Uh, ordinal variables must be arranged in increasing or decreasing order. And what do we have here? These are nominal uh, categories. They're all the same. They're all national measurements. Uh, ordinal level, uh, low and high. This is aggressive aggression and, and friendship, I guess. Interval level, a measurement of temperature uh, uh, in degrees. And then ratio level is uh, the measurement of, of group size. OK. Ordinal uh, variables are ordinary, uh, ordinarily continuous. The intervals are usually of, of equal width. But the width depends on both the number of observations to be classified and the research purposes. The larger the number of observations, the wider the intervals become. Uh, however, uh, wider categories also result in greater loss of detailed information. And this is the Scoville chili heat chart. I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, the sweet bell pepper has, has no heat. Red chilies are, are 50 to 750 Scoville units. Uh, yellow genetics. 500 to 1,000, Chile Verde, uh, Anaheim, uh, Pablano, Pablano, Pasilla, uh, Chilaca, Rajillo. Here's the jalapeno. There's something that everybody knows. Jalapeno three, f between 3,500 and 8,000 uh, Scoville heat units. Uh, what is another? Cayenne pepper. Cayenne, 30,000 to 50,000. So they're, what, 10 times stronger, hotter than jalapeno peppers. Uh, habanero, there's the habanero. Ooh, that's what? Where's my jalapeno? There we are. Habanero is uh, 100 times strong, hotter than, uh, than a jalapeno. Uh, my daughter raises habanero. She's nuts. Uh, anyway, the rest of these. Pure capsaicin. Anyway, there you go. All the all the hot peppers, the, the bell peppers on the bottom, and 15 million units. My goodness. <laughs> uh, I, I may have told you this story once upon a time. I I played uh, softball for a uh, a uh, Mexican softball team in Lubbock, Texas, and uh, they were actually from Mexico, and they would go back back home from time to time and then they'd come back and they'd have uh, they'd have jars of peppers and whatnot and of course I'm not real bright uh, but this one time they kept saying well just just eat one just eat one don't don't eat very much you know and they would they wanted me to try their peppers uh, and uh, this one time I did and it blistered my it blistered my lips and it blistered my tongue uh, and of course the guy that made me, that he didn't make me, of course, he, he talked me into it. His wife came over and just read him the riot act because she kept saying, what, a, what did she call me? Flacco. <laughs> he's, 
<laughs> he's just a skinny little guy. Why do you why do you, why do you do this to him? And of course, everybody was laughing, and and uh, he apologized later. It took like a week and a half for my my lips and my tongue to uh, to heal. Anyway, uh, they they were really nice. They took care of. Them. I had two kids at the time and no wife, so uh, uh, the uh, all the women would take care of my kids. I think they got taken care of better at a softball game than they did any other time. Uh, they were everybody watched it. Like it was, it was really kind of cool, and they were really sweet people, just the sweetest people in the world. Anyway, that's my experience with. I don't even know what kind they were, uh, and of course the guy kept saying, "Oh, these aren't very hot. These aren't very hot." He take a big bite, you know. Of course, you know they. His, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Hoosier. I'm a, I'm from Indiana, and I, my, my uh, level of 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 heat. Uh, it goes to chili peppers, I'm afraid. Uh, so that's as hot as I, as I had ever tasted at that point. It was probably a habanero or something. Well, it was something hotter than that. Well, maybe it was a habanero. Anyway, yeah, I blistered my mouth. Didn't do very well in that game. I was in pain. To facilitate comparisons, uh, researchers convert frequencies to proportions or percentages. You obtain a proportion by dividing the frequency of a category by the total number of responses in the distribution. When multiplied by 100, a proportion becomes a percentage. Uh, proportions are usually expressed as F over N and percentages as F over N times 100. N stands for number, the number of whatever it is. <clears throat> Both proportions and percentages reflect the relative frequency of a specific category in the distribution. And here we go. Uh, there were seven. Uh, there's a total of, of 20. So uh, there were seven purple ones. Seven over 20 equals 35 percent. Three blue ones, 15 percent. And there you, there you have the frequencies. Three commonly used graphs, pie, pie chart, bar chart, and histogram. Both the pie chart and the bar chart can be used to present data measured at the nominal and ordinal levels. Researchers use the, histo the histogram to display data measured at interval or ratio levels. Uh, the types of graphs, uh, bar graph, that's a bar graph, uh, a line graph, this is a line graph, uh, a circle graph, a pie chart, there you go, uh, histogram, and a steam and leaf plot. This is a steam, stem and leaf plot. Pie charts show uh, differences in frequencies or percentages among categories of nominal or ordinal variables by displaying the categories as segments of a circle. While one pie chart can be used to represent a single distribution, researchers often use two or more pies to compare distributions. NBA championships, there's Boston Stelics have won 24% of the championships and the Los Angeles Lakers and Minneapolis Lakers, 22%. There's the Bulls, 8%. San Antonio Spurs, 7%. Philadelphia 76ers, Golden State Warriors, uh, San Francisco, okay. What is that? I can't see it. Eight percent, I think. Bar chart is a, a tool for displaying nominal or ordinal uh, data. Uh, two or more distributions may be presented as a single bar chart. The uh, height of each bar is proportional to the frequency of percentage uh, of the category. It may be displayed either horizontally or vertically. And this is a bar chart. A histogram display frequency distributions of interval level or ratio level data. The histogram looks like a bar graph with no spaces between the rectangles. Rectangles are constructed contiguously uh, to show that the variable is continuous and intervals rather than discrete categories are displayed across the horizontal axis. Unlike the bar chart, the histogram cannot be used to display information for more than one variable. And this is, oh, this is COVID deaths. I don't even know when it is, but uh, as you can see, it's, it's dated. It's really dated up because I made this up last, last year. 
Measures of central tendency are statistical measures that reflect a typical or an average characteristic of a frequency distribution. The three measures social scientists most commonly use are mode, median, and arithmetic mean. Mode is a category or observation that appears most frequently in the distribution. Mode is used as a measure of central tendency, mostly with distributions of nominal var variables. Uh, they, they identify the mode by singling out the category containing the largest number of responses. In this case, with this set of numbers, uh, the, uh, the one that is the mode is 6 because there are three 6s and there are only two 9s and two 3s. Uh, so there, 6 is the mode in this distribution. Advantage of the mode, easy to identify by inspecting the frequency distribution. Therefore, it can be used as a first and quick indicator of the central tendency in a distribution. The limitation of the mode, it, it, is, uh, it, it is a sensitive indicator. Its position can shift if the, if the researcher changes the way that the distribution is divided into categories. Therefore, it is not a very stable measure of central tendency. The median is a positional measure that divides the distribution into two equal parts. The median is defined as the observation that is located halfway between the smallest and the largest observations in the distribution. And in this case, the one in the middle is the number 13. So you would say the median is 13. Mean is the most frequently used measure of central tendency, as we saw in this chart right, right here. The mean is the most frequently used uh, uh, statistic. If I can get back to it. There we, there we go. Suitable for measuring uh, distributions measured on an interval level or ratio level and lends itself to mathematical uh, calculations. Uh, the mean also serves as a basis for other statistical measures. The mean is defined as the sum total of all observations divided by their number. And in this case, we're adding all of these numbers together. Uh, we get 105. There are seven numbers, so we divide 7 into 105, and we get 15. So the mean is 15. However, if we look at these numbers, uh, there's no number that is here more than once. Uh, so there is no mode. The median number would be, uh, let's see, there's 7, 12, 13, 14. It would be 15. <laughs> it would also be 15. In symbolic notation, the mean is defined as bar x equals whatever that symbol is, x over n. Uh, anyway, there you go. <clears throat> range measures the distance between the highest and lowest values of the distribution. For example, 4, 6, 8, 9, 17. The range is the difference between 17 and 4, which is 13. The range is useful for gaining a quick impression of the data, but it is a crude measure of dispersion because only accounts for the two extreme values of the distribution. Interquartile range, uh, difference between the lower and upper quartiles, uh, Q1 and Q3, because it measures the spread of the middle half of the distribution, it is uh, less affected by extreme uh, observations. The range can also be calculated for other measures of location. Uh, for example, uh, can, it can be calc you can calculate the range, range between the 10th and the 90th percentiles to measure the dispersion of the middle 80% of the observations. And in this case, we're talking about, well, that's the median. Oh. So the inner quartile would be the difference between 52 and 58, or 6 would be the inner quartile range. The simplest way to obtain a measure of deviation is uh, to calculate the average deviation from the mean. Uh, okay. And that's the formula you would use. 
Uh, however, the sum of the deviations from the mean is always equal to zero. Thus, the average deviation will be zero, for its numerator will always be zero. To compensate for this property of the mean, we square each de uh, deviation to calculate standard deviation, uh, the, the measure of dispersion uh, most commonly applied to interval level data. Let me see if I did this. Okay. So we're talking about five different numbers, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. We're talking about five different numbers here. Six numbers. Two of them are the same. Uh, so in order to get the standard deviation, what we do is we take, uh, where's the number? Oh, 3.35 is the number. So we subtract that uh, 2.83 from 3.35. We subtract uh, 0 0.69 from 2.83. We subtract, well, we do that twice. We have a 0 0.03. We subtract that from 2.83. I think that's huh. okay. All right. Well, and, uh, variance and standard deviation are calculated by squaring and summing the deviations, uh, and then dividing the sum by the total number of observations. The definitional formula for variance is this, uh, where s squared equals the variance. In other words, the mean is subtracted from each score. The differences are then squared, summed, and divided by the total number of observations. To calculate the variance, the squared mean is subtracted from the squared sum of all the scores, divided by the number of observations. And these are your numbers, and the mean of that would be, uh, what, 5. So if we add all those together, that would be 16, 21, uh, 26, 30, 40. That would be 40. 40 divided by 8 is 5, so 5 is your mean. So you su would subtract 5 from each of these numbers. Uh, 5 minus 2 is a minus 3. When you square minus 3 and minus, when you square minus 3, it's 9. Uh, 4. Uh, you it would be uh, minus 1, and that would be 1, 1, 1. All those 4s would be 1. Uh, 5 would be 0. Uh, 7 would be 2, and you square that, that's 4. And 9 would be 4, and you square that, it's 16. So you add up all those numbers. 16, 4, 1, 1, 1, 1, 9, and you get 20, 32. 32 divided by 8 is 4, and the population standard deviation is equal to the square root of the variance. So the square root of two of 4 is 2, and uh, that would be your standard deviation would be 2. And that's the way it's done. I mean, it's not that hard. Um, you find the mean and subtract it from all of your numbers. And then you multiply it, then you square it by, you square it, or, or you multiply it by itself. So in this case, it would be 3 times 3. In this case, it would be 1, plus, 1 times 1, 1 times 1, 1 times 1, uh, 0 times 0, 0 times 0, uh, zero uh, 2 times 2, which is 4, and 4 times 4, which is 16. Then you add all of those up and divide them by the number of, by the number in this case 8, and then you get 4, then you need to find the square root of this number right here, and that would be 2. There you go. And that's what that's all this, this formula means. The square root of the variance uh, transforms the variance into the standard deviation. The standard deviation is a measure expressing dispersion in the original units of measurement, and the, this is the formula for standard deviation. 
When the data are arranged in frequency distribution, we can use the following modified formula to calculate variance. And what am I going to do that? How much more do I have to go? Oh, we're talking about bell curves. Sorry, I wanted to see how far we had to go. <laughs> when data are arranged in frequency distribution, we can use the following modified formula. We already talked about that. The advantages of standard deviation. It is more st uh, st stable uh, from sample to sample. Uh, it is, has some important mathematical properties that enable the researcher to obtain standard deviation for two or more groups combined. Its mathematical uh, properties make it a useful measure in more advanced statistical work, especially in the area of statistical inferences. Symbolically, the coefficient of variation is defined as follows. Uh, v equals uh, s over x bar. Uh, v is the co 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 coefficient of variation. S is a standard deviation. And x bar is the arithmetic mean. So our standard of uh, variation in this last example, the mean would be is 8. And the standard deviation is 2. Let's remember that when we go back to our formula. Whoops. <laughs> OK. So the coefficient of variation, uh, the, the standard deviation was 2, if you remember. And the arithmetic mean was 8. So if we divide 8 into 20, uh, we get what? Uh, let me get my calculator. Uh, wait a minute. Turn it on. Uh, 2 divided by 8, and the answer is 0 0.25. I'm sorry, my brain isn't working that well today. Uh, so that would be the coefficient of variation is 0 0.25. The simplest way to describe a distribution is by a visual representation, and that is a bell curve. In non-symmetrical or skewed distributions, there are more extreme cases in one direction of the distribution than in the other. A non-symmetrical distribution in which there are more extremely low scores is referred to as a negatively skewed distribution. When there are more extremely high scores, the distribution is positively skewed. Most income distributions are positively skewed, with few families having extremely high incomes. Skewness can also be identified uh, according to the positions of the measures of central tendency. In symmetrical distributions, the mean will coincide with the median and the mode. In skewed distributions, there will be discrepancies between these measures. In a negatively skewed distribution, the mean will be pulled in the direction of the lower scores. In a positively skewed distribution, it will be located closer to the higher scores. Let me give you an, a, a real quick example. I used to teach at an institution called Ashford University. It was a privately owned school. Uh, it was a for-profit school. Uh, one of the years that we were there, uh, the profit, I can't remember what the profit was, but I was making like $50,000 a year. Uh, the guy that, uh, this, the CEO of the, of the institution uh, made $3 million that year, and he got $22 million in bonuses. Uh, so in essence, he made $25 million that year. So if we looked at his, assuming that I was the lowest paid guy, uh, salaried employee, and we looked at his value or his, uh, uh, the wages that he earned, he earned $24 million and I earned $50,000. So the distribution would be skewed very positively toward him because he made that much more money. Actually, it would be in the other direction, because, because he was the only one that made $25 million. There were other individuals that made $5 million and uh, $7 million, uh, but most, most of his employees made, made less than, than uh, $100,000, and that was me. The normal curve has a great significance in the field of statistics. It is symmetrical and bell-shaped, the mode, the median, and the mean coincide at the center of the distribution. The curve is based on an, uh, 
on an infinite number of observations. A single mathematical formula describes how frequencies are related to the values of the variable. In any normal distribution, a fixed proportion of the observations lies between the mean and the fixed units of standard deviations. This is a normal distribution. It's a normal curve. As you can see, it's a, they call it a bell curve because it's shaped just like a bell. Researchers can use the normal curve to evaluate the proportion of observations included within a desired interval. The raw scores must be converted to standard deviation units to use the table, which reports areas under the normal curve. When raw scores have been converted to standard scores, a single table can be used to evaluate any distribution, regardless of the scale on which the data were measured, and distributions measured on different scales can be directly compared. We can look at, uh, this, is, this is the way uh, the research was done on marijuana causing schizophrenia. What they did, uh, they looked at a normal distribution of schizophrenia in the population. This, is, this was in Denmark. And the normal distribution was 1.4. 1.4% of all people come down with marijuana, come down with schizophrenia. So that, that was the normal curve, 1.4, well, was, a, was a normal bell, bell curve. Uh, so when they looked at uh, uh, people who smoked marijuana, what they discovered was that instead of uh, the, uh, aver the, the number of people who uh, develop uh, schizophrenia being 1.4 percent, it was uh, 8 percent. Uh, so what they determined was that uh, that marijuana, smoking marijuana, can uh, it doesn't cause schizophrenia. Uh, what it does, it it uh, uh, induces the individual to develop schizophrenic uh, tendencies earlier and uh, more positively, I guess. Uh, anyway, th this is how they did it. They looked at the two, uh, the the distribution of the two, uh, of the of the uh, normal of, of the normal population and of the marijuana smoking population. And what they determined was that uh, uh, the uh, marijuana smoking portion uh, of the population uh, had skewed results as far as schizophrenia was concerned. Observations are converted into standard deviation units by means of the following equation. Uh, Z equals uh, X minus X bar over S, where Z equals the number of standard deviation units. X equals the number uh, obs of observations. The X bar is the arithmetic mean, and the uh, S equals a standard deviation. Uh, okay. Z, sometimes referred to as a standard score, expresses the distance between a specific observation X and the mean in terms of standard deviation units. A Z or 2 means that the uh, dis distance between the mean of the distribution and X is two, two standard deviations. And that is the end of it. Uh, as far as statistics are concerned, I... I, 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 what I want you to understand is that we can use statistics in our research. That's, that's really what I'm, I'm getting at here. Um, I don't expect you to, to remember uh, how to do a standard deviation. I just want you to know that it is useful and that the mean is, is probably the most uh, useful statistic that you will ever get. Uh, and, of course, logically, you would think, Sure, averages, uh, it's the average score, and, and of course that's exactly what it is. So uh, we're all done. Thank you very much for your patience with, uh, with me and research. Uh, hopefully that if you uh, ever need any help with uh, research, uh, I will be glad to uh, do whatever I can to help you. Uh, you've been a great class, and thank you very much. Um, uh, Good luck. Get everything done. Get it in by next, uh, by the 30th of July, and we'll all be happy. So I'll see you next semester.